Hey everybody, this is your buddy Carl for a, another daily Bible reading and I'm just getting in place another uh, packed day and it's all good. Let's hit July the 24th. Now July 24th of 2020 is a Friday. There you go, it's a Friday, but we're catching up. July 24th, let's just dive in and see what the readings were for July 24th. We are in 2 Chronicles chapter 11 through chapter 13. How about that? So they move quickly. Let's dive in and see what's going on. So I remember King David, kingdom went to King uh, Solomon, and then King Rehoboam sent, uh, yeah, remember, sent Adoniram, who was in charge of the labor force to restore order, but the people of Israel stoned him to death. Remember, after Sol King David left and Solomon left, this new king, hmm, yeah, totally... Yeah, not like his father. Scary. All right, here we go. Let's just read and see what happens. So, yep, yep. Okay. Chapter 11, 2 Chronicles. When Rehoboam arrived in Jerusalem, he mobilized the men of Judah and Benjamin, 180,000 select troops to fight against Israel and to restore the kingdom to himself. All right, but the Lord said to Shemaiah, the man of God, say to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the Israelites in Judah and Benjamin, this is what the Lord says, do not fight, do not fight against your relatives. Go back home, for what has happened is my doing. Hmm. So they obeyed the message of the Lord and did not fight against Jeroboam. How about that? Rehoboam remained in Jerusalem and fortified various towns for the defense of Judah. He built up Bethlehem, Etam, Tekoa, Beth Zur, Zoka, Adulam, Gath, Marasha, Ziph, Adoram, Lachish, Azeka, Zora, Aijalon, and Hebron. These became the fortified towns of Judah and Benjamin. Rehoboam strengthened their defenses and stationed commanders in them and stored supplies of food, olive oil, and wine. He also put shields and spears in these towns as further safety measures. So only Judah and Benjamin remained under his control. So only two of the tribes, right? Here we go. But all the priests and Levites living among the northern tribes of Israel sided with Rehoboam. Okay, the Levites even abandoned their pasture lands and property and moved to Judah and Jerusalem because Jeroboam and his sons would not allow them to serve the Lord as priest. Jeroboam appointed his own priest to serve at the pagan shrines where they worshiped the goat and calf idols they had made. Okay, just... Just a generation back, remember Solomon and King David worshiping the Lord, their sons going astray. But remember King Solomon in his old age, with all these foreign wives and concubines, was bringing in all this perversion into the country. Ah, Lord, help your people. There you go. Um, yeah, so there they go. Uh, Jeroboam appointed priests because they had these calf idols and goats craziness. Verse 16, from all the tribes of Israel, those who sincerely wanted to worship the Lord, the God of Israel, followed the Levites to Jerusalem where they could offer sacrifices to the Lord, their God of their ancestors. This strengthened, strengthened the kingdom of Judah and for three years they supported Rehoboam, son of Solomon, for during those years they faithfully followed in the footsteps of David and Solomon. All right, moving on, verse 18. Rehoboam married his cousin, Mahalath, the daughter of David's son, Jeremoth, and of Abihel, the daughter of Eliab, son of Jesse. Mahalath had three sons, Yehush, Jamariah, and Zaham. Later, Rehoboam married another cousin, Maka, the daughter of Absalom. Maka gave birth to Abijah, Ate, Ziza, and Shelomith. Rehoboam loved Maka more than any of his other wives and concubines. In all, he had 18 wives and 60 concubines, and they gave birth to 28 sons and 60 daughters. Imagine that house 
housewarming party. Wow. Rehoboam appointed Makkah's son Abijah as leader among the princes, making it clear that he would be the next king. Rehoboam also wisely gave responsibilities to his other sons and stationed some of them in the fortified towns throughout the land of Judah and Benjamin. He provided them with generous provisions, and he found many wives for them. Chapter 12 of Second Chronicles Egypt's evading Judah, or invading it. Look at this. But when Rehoboam was firmly established and strong, he abandoned the law of the Lord, and all Israel followed him in this sin. Because they were unfaithful to the Lord, King Shishak of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam's reign. He came with 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horses, and a countless army of foot soldiers, including Libyans, Sukites, and Ethiopians. Shishak conquered Judah's fortified towns and then advanced to attack, to attack Jerusalem. The prophet Shemaiah then met with Rehoboam with Judah and Judah's leaders and, and all that fled to Jerusalem because of Shishak. Shemaiah told them, This is what the Lord says, You have abandoned me, so I am abandoning you to Shishak. Then the leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is right in doing this to us. When the Lord saw their change of heart, he gave this message to Shemaiah. Since the people have humbled themselves, I will not completely destroy them and will soon give them, give them some relief. I will not use Shishak to pour out my anger on Jerusalem. But they will become his subjects so they will know the difference between serving me and serving earthly rulers. Ah! Here you go. Papa, Father God, is using a life lesson for his people. Let's move on. Verse 9. So King Shishak of Egypt came up and attacked Jerusalem. He ransacked the treasuries of the Lord's temple and the royal palace. He stole everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. King Rehoboam later replaced them with bronze shields as substitutes, and he entrusted them to the care of the commanders of the guard who protected the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the temple of the Lord, the guards would also take the shields and then return them to the guard room. Because Rehoboam humbled himself, the Lord's anger was turned away and he did not destroy him completely. There were still some good things in the land of Judah. King Rehoboam firmly established himself in Jerusalem and continued to rule. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem. The city the Lord had chosen from among all the tribes of Israel as the place to honor his name. Rehoboam's mother was Nama, a woman from Ammon. But he was an evil king, for he did not seek the Lord with all his heart. Notice that phrase, folks. He was Eve considered evil because he didn't seek the Lord with all his heart. He wandered. Ah, poor guy. Well, there you go. Power, the, the power of free will. Mm. Verse 15, the rest of the events of Rehoboam's reign from beginning to end are recorded in the record of Shemaiah the prophet and the record of Ido the seer, which are part of the genealogical record. Rehoboam and Jeroboam were continually at war with each other. When Rehoboam died, he was buried in the city of David. Then his son Abijah became the next king. Okay, July 24th, we are going to read chapter 13, so keep moving with me. These kings, right? Generation to generation, free will. They decide how they're going to rule, what they're going to believe. Even their families, their father cannot force their hand, right? Chapter 13 of Second Chronicles. Abijah began to rule over Judah in the 18th year of Jeroboam's reign in Israel. He reigned in Jerusalem three years. His mother was Makkah, the daughter of Uriel from Gibeah. Then war broke out between Abijah and Jeroboam. Judah, led by King Abijah, fielded 400,000 select warriors while 
Jeroboam mustered 800,000 select troops from Israel, two against one. When the army of Judah arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Abijah stood on Mount Zemaraim and shouted to Jeroboam and all Israel, Listen to me! Don't you realize that the Lord, the God of Israel, made a lasting covenant with David, giving him and his descendants the throne of Israel forever? Yet Jeroboam, son of Nebat, a mere servant of David's son Solomon, rebelled against his master. Then a whole gang of scoundrels joined him, defying Solomon's son Rehoboam when he was young and inexperienced and could not stand up to them. Do you really think that you can stand against the kingdom of the Lord that is led by the descendants of David? You may have a vast army, and you have those gold calves that Jeroboam made, you, made as your gods, but you have chased away the priest of the Lord, the descendants of Aaron and the Levites, and you have, you have appointed your own priests just like the pagan nations. You let anyone become a priest these days. Whoever comes to be dedicated with a young bull and seven rams can become a priest of these so-called gods of yours. Notice that the so-called gods, they're not gods, they're pagan, demonic, you know, making a mock of God. Anyway, moving on, chapter, verse 10, still in chapter 13. But as for us, the Lord is our God and we have not abandoned him. Only the, the descendants of Aaron serve the Lord as priests and the Levites alone may help them in their work. They present burnt offerings and fragrant incense to the Lord every morning and evening. They place the bread of the presence on the holy table, and they light the gold lampstand every evening. We are following the instructions of the Lord our God, but you have abandoned him, so you see God is with us. He is our leader. His priests blow their trumpets and, and lead us into battle against you. O oh, people of Israel, do not fight against the Lord, the God of your ancestors, for you will not succeed. Meanwhile, Jeroboam had secretly, secretly sent part of his army around behind the men of Judah to ambush them. When Judah realized that they were being attacked from the front and the rear, they cried out to the Lord for help. Then the priests blew the trumpets, and the men of Judah began to shout, at the sound of their battle cry, God defeated Jeroboam and all Israel and routed them before Abijah and the army of Judah. Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Judah stayed in the Lord, right? The Israelite army fled from Judah and God handed them over to Judah in defeat. Abijah and his army inflicted heavy losses on them. 500,000 of Israel's select troops were killed that day. So Judah defeated Israel on that occasion because they trusted in the Lord, the God of their ancestors. Abijah and his army pursued Jeroboam's troops and captured some of his towns, including Bethel, Jeshanah, and Ephron, along with their surrounding villages. So Jeroboam of Israel never regained his power. There you go. Jeroboam of Israel never regained power. He became a pagan king, right? And finally, the Lord struck him down and he died. Meanwhile, Abijah of Judah grew more and more powerful. He married 14 wives and had 22 sons and 16 daughters. The rest of the events of Abijah's reign, including his words and deeds, are recorded in the commentary of Ido the prophet. And folks, there you go. That's the Old Testament reading for July the 24th. Let's move on. July the 24th, Psalm is 18, picking it up at verse 37, and we'll finish it out finally today. Psalm 18, picking it up at 37. King David, I chased my enemies and caught them. I did not stop until they were conquered. I struck them down so they could not get up, and they fell beneath my feet. You have armed me with strength for the battle and have subdued my enemies under my feet. You placed my foot on their necks. I have destroyed all who hated me. They called for help, but no one came to their rescue. They even cried to the Lord, but he refused to answer. Wow. I ground them as fine dust in, in the wind. I swept them into the gutter like dirt. You gave me victory over my accusers. 
You appointed me ruler over nations. People I don't even know now serve me. As soon as they hear of me, they submit. Foreign nations cringe before me. They all lose their courage and come trembling from the strongholds, from their strongholds. Verse 46, The Lord lives, praise to my rock. May the God of my salvation be exalted. He is the God who pays back those who harm me. He subdues the nations under me and rescues me from my enemies. You hold me safe beyond the reach of my enemies. You save me from violent opponents. For this, O Lord, I will praise you among the nations. I will sing praises to your name. You give great victories to your king. You show unfailing love to your anointed, to David and all his descendants forever. Thank you, Lord. All right, folks, there you go. And that finishes Psalm 18, a Psalm of David, proclaiming the favor and the goodness of God. All right, July 24th, today's proverb is Proverbs 19, verses 27 through 29. And this will finish the 19th book of Proverbs. If you stop listening to instruction, my child, my friend, you will turn your back on knowledge. Hmm. Other translations make that clear. If you stop learning, you'll soon forget what you already know. There's something about the exercise of wisdom and gaining knowledge that increases our knowledge, right? So God calls us to stay in a place to be instructed and to learn. Verse 28, a corrupt witness makes a mockery of justice. The mouth of the wicked gulps down evil. Wicked people just feed on more wickedness. Sad, but true. And it takes the change of heart, people turning to God to learn a better way. Verse 29, punishment is made for mockers, and the backs of fools are made to be beaten. Mm. Wow, it means somehow there's judgment and there will be punishment for foolishness in some form or another. Help us, Lord. May we always walk in your wisdom and humility. All right. July 24th, today we are finishing up Romans, picking it up at verse 26. Romans, folks, Romans is a five-star chapter. It, Paul is confirming our stance in Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to move on. I'm going to read it. Here we are. July 24th, Romans, picking it up at chapter 8, verse 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all our hearts, he knows our hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believer, believers in harmony with God's will. You know, so some of that, let me pause here real quick. Sometimes that groaning of the Spirit is, sometimes we can be praying, Lord, Lord, and then you're just, oh, oh God, oh, oh. <laughs> You know, sometimes when your emotions are just being, being poured out, you feel something in your spirit, but you don't even know what to pray. Holy Spirit is communicating with the Lord still. He knows our heart better than us. If you pray in the spirit, if you have the gift of tongues, that's also a spiritual language that communicates with the Father. It's the Holy Spirit. And I encourage you, if you have the gift of tongues, use it Often, even Paul preaches that, I wish you'd all pray in tongues more and more, more than I do. And he prays in tongues at all times. Something to remember. Ask God for the gift. Receive it. Let your mouth be open and pray in the Spirit at all times. We know that God causes everything. So, there you go. So the Spirit pleads for the believers in harmony with God's will. Verse 28, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. For God knew His people in advance, and He chose them to become like His Son, so that His Son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. Oh, folks, so much there. So when you become like Christ, you become the part of the chosen. Doesn't mean that there's just select people and God knows that one's, well, God knows everything, but it doesn't mean that 
If you want to get saved, you can't get saved because God didn't put you on a list. That's not how that works. That's not what this says. But some people confuse that. I'm moving on. But there you go. So as family, as sons and, and sons and daughters of the living God, as father, we become brothers and sisters to Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, which is the fullness of who God is. It's powerful who we are in the Lord. Verse 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who could ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give everything else? Who dares accuse us, whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Ah, folks, another five-star statement. God himself gave us right standing. We don't do it. When we receive Christ, our right standing comes in under the blood of Christ and his great sacrifice. Thank you, Father. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So who can condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Verse 35, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he, he no longer love, loves us if we are, have troubles and trials or calamity or persecutions or hungry and we're struggling or destitute or we're in danger or threatened with death or the plague or anything else? No, does that mean God doesn't love us? No, not at all. As the scriptures say... For your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all of those things, struggles and anything, overwhelming victory is still ours through Christ who loved us. Verse 38, And I am convinced, Paul and me, Carl, and you as a believer, if you're a believer in Jesus, you, we are convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the power of hell itself can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow, folks. I even have five stars, four stars. I'm going to add a fifth. <laughs> Smiley face, writing big. This is like, mm, it just gets better. The book of Romans, Paul is confirming who we are in Christ. Nothing separates us once we're in him. All right, there you go. We're going to pause there today. That finishes out chapter eight of Romans. We'll continue tomorrow for another great daily Bible reading. Bless you all. We'll see you again. Bye-bye.